Um, good morning, everyone. I see that we have some attendees here and I believe a few more will probably chime in um, as we get going, um, but let's get started. Um, before we start, I'd just like to say, I think for the sake of ICES, it's in our best interest to keep going with this lecture series to keep people informed, not just about Ukraine, but about all topics related to our region. Not everything is related, but at the same time, today, if Matthew covers anything from the Austro-Hungarian Empire with architecture, one could also potentially see the same thing in Lviv, um, and it might inform a picture you might see in the next week. Um, let's hope not, but at the same time, this kind of information can be useful, completely brought together. So today, I'd really, um, I'm very excited to introduce, Ma introduce Matthew Worsnick. Um, we met in Brussels a few years ago, actually the last time probably both of us were in Europe at a conference, and um, it's my pleasure to finally be able to host him at ICES, albeit virtual, but better um, virtual than not. So trained as both an architect and architectural historian, Matthew Worsnick is assistant professor of the practice of art and architectural history at Vanderbilt University. He earned his PhD from the Institute for Fine Arts at NYU and his, M, uh, his master's in architecture at um, Columbia University. In 2018, he was a curatorial fellow at the Museum of Modern Art, where he worked on the exhibition Toward a Concrete Utopia, Architecture in Yugoslavia, 1948 to 1980. Um, his research has been supported by grants from the National Council for Eurasian and East European Research, the Wolfsonian FIU Museum, um, that's Florida International University, and the Mellon Foundation. And most recently, he won a National Endowment of the Humanities Fellowship in support of his book project, Designs on Territory, Mental Maps and the Fabrication of a Contested Border. Matthew, please. Oh, I think you, oh, you're not muted. Great. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, thank you, Zach. Uh, first, I wanna thank uh, everybody and everything who made this possible. I see, uh, of course, John Connolly, uh, Jeff Pennington, Zach, Kelly, uh, and also Sarah Kramsey uh, for hosting the conference in Brussels that um, first connected me with um, Zach and, and Jeff. Um, I also want to acknowledge what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I'm sure it's weighing on everybody here. Um, so um, even if you're here just to find something else to occupy your mind, um, thanks for coming. Um, this is part of a larger manuscript, uh, as, as Zach mentioned, on, uh, on the built environment along the interwar borders that was contested between uh, Italy and, and Yugoslavia. Um, it's been- uh, Matthew, can I interrupt you for one second? I think your um, dings from your messenger are killing your microphone and then cutting you out. Um, hmm. Let me, see. Let me, I closed messenger. Is closed. Um, hmm. Let me. Let me. Can you, you hear me? I can hear you now. Great. Thank you for for letting me know. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can um, try to. Yeah. And don't worry, we we have time. To, yeah. Um. So. You can hear me. All yes. Good? Great. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, hold on. I spilled a little water also as I was trying to fix that. Um, so uh, this is this is from that that larger manuscript that uh, Zach mentioned, which is on uh, the contested border between Italy and Yugoslavia and the built environment um, uh, of it. Uh, this particular piece has been sitting for a while and I've just started to rework it in the last couple of months. Um, I look forward to your thoughts and feedback. Um, oh, I should uh, share my screen. Uh, Actually, Matthew, while you set that up, um, people are still saying it's a little hard to hear. Is there any way you could bring your microphone or computer maybe a little bit closer to you? Yeah, let's see if. Um, oh. <laughs> All kinds of trouble. <laughs> it's all right. Are is this is this better? Yeah, you're actually just ever the timbre is a little bit clearer. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, good. There we go. So shall I? Uh, are we, you were shared, you see my, uh, my title page? Yes, your screen is better. And I just got a message saying much better for vocals, for your sound. Thank you, thank you um, 
audience for that uh, for for that feedback. Um, see, I ask for feedback and I get it immediately. Um, so this, uh, well, well, let's get going. Um, in the aftermath of World War II, um, socialist Yugoslavia acquired contested border territories along the Adriatic coast that had previously been held by uh, Italy. And you'll see here, uh, uh, do you see my, uh, my mouse as well? Correct. Yeah, you can see the cursor going around. Great. So um, here we have an Italian map from right after World War II. Uh, and here it, it marks out the, well, the lost te territory in this angry red. We've got Zara, uh, we've got the islands of Kvarner and, uh, and Istria and the region around it. Um, so that's going to give context for a lot of what we're seeing. And you'll see uh, this in, um, in a, a number of, recurrent number of times in the lecture. Um, so in these recently reconfigured borderlands, Yugoslav architecture and urban development faced uh, particular challenges. Um, prominent among them was the need to lay claim to places designed, constructed, and understood for a generation to be part of fascist Italy. Um, building in the borderlands thus took on a particular political character, at times provocative, uh, at times subtle, but always uh, deliberate. Uh, in general, Socialist Yugoslav propaganda aggressively derided things associated with interwar Italy. Uh, and I'll say I'm going to a, a black screen. I'm going to do that when I, when I don't want you looking at anything. Um, the young country's foundational mythology and accompanying rhetoric positioned it as the opposite to fascism. Uh, communist Yugoslavia was the people's liberator from the fascist terror. Uh, but pragmatically, the young country couldn't just erase the functional markers of Italianicity that were, were strewn across the landscape. Uh, Mussolini had poured resources into domestic building projects, particularly in the contested territories, leaving a network of valuable infrastructure and urban development that suddenly belonged to war-wrecked Yugoslavia, which faced severe housing shortages, famine, uh, and even guerrilla conflict. Uh, fascist aligned building projects could hardly be ripped down like a propaganda poster, uh, even though as figures in the landscape and social organizers, some of them celebrated fascism no less than a state-sponsored newsreel or a polemical publication. Reviewing uh, post-war political, urban planning, and historic preservation archives, it seems that no cogent policy was enacted by upper-level officials in Belgrade on how to use still valuable remnants of Italian fascism. Uh, administrative exchanges in the first post-war decade indicate a general frustration with a lack of coherent policies or enforcement and a hodgepodge of responses uh, at many levels by the early disordered and crisis beleaguered Yugoslav government. Uh, for example, uh, the large bronze eagle uh, at the top of the central tower in Rijeka, uh, a long cherished symbol of the city, albeit a monument with imperial and Italian irredentist associations, was removed in January 1949 um, by a person not named in documents. Uh, I'll point out this is the Italian version of it. Uh, it was a Habsburg double-headed eagle, and then the Italians came up and, and sawed off one of the heads to make it a fascist eagle. Um, and then again, it was, it was removed uh, by, by someone uh, in very in early post-war Yugoslavia. So across three days, this person methodically built a scaffold, removed the sculpture, cutting it into a bunch of pieces, and then disappeared along with the dismembered bronze eagle. Uh, all of this happened to the great frustration of the director of the Office of Preservation of Memorial Culture, uh, which was located just around the corner in Rijeka. Um, it was unable to elicit, she was unable to elicit any response from the state bureaucracy. Uh, during the three days that this man was working, uh, the director received not only silence from the public prosecutor's office, uh, among multiple other agencies. Um, I'm sorry, she received only silence uh, from the public prosecutor's office. She notes in a letter that uh, this was not the first time such a thing had occurred, which seems strange to me. I mean, the whole event seems strange. Um, but the fact that things like this were happening apparently on a fairly regular basis is, is um, stunning. Um, and she notes that this disassembly broke at least some of the preservation laws that had been enacted in the new state's 
preceding four years. Uh, it's clear that policy, law, politics, and propaganda remained markedly unaligned uh, when it came to the task of curating the built space of the contested territories. Um, architecture and art in the contested lands engaged an effort to establish the territories as firmly Yugoslav. Uh, however, this did not mean wholesale erasure, uh, whether through economic necessity or a desire to engage rather than deny the region's mixed history. Uh, architecture in the region often appropriated the work that fascist Italy had built uh, and even the polemics that uh, Italy had deployed by converting, detouring, or otherwise inhabiting the cultural labor of Yugoslavia's predecessors. Um, digging through archives that touch on the incorporation of formerly Italian land into, into post-war Yugoslavia, three uh, specific patterns emerge, each claiming territory in a uh, different way. First, uh, as we see here, um, the socialist government quickly constructed many memorials to the heroes and the victims of the war. Every corner of formerly Italian lands was eventually left dotted with memorials, some epic, some mundane. Um, through these memorials, the land was redefined as rightly belonging to those who suffered under and eventually defeated these fascist brutes. Um, the second strategy of reappropriation was a propaganda campaign to conceptually reconfigure the territory in people's minds. Uh, representations of the region in maps and tour books found a new form, conveying entirely different mental maps of those advanced by Italy during the interwar period. And here on the left, you see one from Italy in the interwar period, and on the right, uh, a, a revision that shows uh, the spaces as, as networked uh, with one another and networked with the, the hinterland. Um, in this way, the so socialist government uh, used its limited financial and material resources to claim borderland territories permanently severing Italy's irredentist claims and fostering one of the most coherent pro-socialist, pro-Yugoslav regions in the country. Um, a third pattern we find, and this is one I'd like to explore in more detail today, uh, is that existing architecture was nearly unanimously left in place and often embraced, uh, but it became reappropriated by socialist ideas and narratives given new meaning. The spatial products of the fascists, new towns, city halls, churches, avenues were, were tweaked in their details, um, stripped of some of the distinctive but superficial Italian features and polemically reappropriated in order to correspond with the big tent Yugoslav model of supranational unity. Um, this was largely enacted through an ad hoc process of local decision making. Uh, that is, it wasn't a state level or a federal uh, level process, but instead uh, uh, individuals uh, all the way down to mayors, builders, architects, and bricklayers. Um, so example one, um, the fascist Italian tower. Um, on the eve of World War II, Yugoslavia and Italy built competitive towers on either side of their border checkpoints in Fiume. Uh, in this image, we see the border checkpoint in the middle. On the left, we see the uh, Italian tower. On the right, we see the, uh, the Yugoslav tower. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about the competition aspects uh, of these building projects. In fact, I wanted to, and at the last minute, I wrenched this piece out uh, of the talk uh, to, to tie it to uh, the topic that we're talking about. But for the purpose, so for the purpose of today's talk, I'll focus on the Italian building. Uh, the tower was funded by a local businessman and irredentist, um, Marco di Arbori, and designed in 1939 by the eminent Trieste-based architect, Umberto Nordio. Uh, Nordio was an outspoken irredentist uh, who had built, just not knowing the audience, uh, irredentism is the, uh, the staking of claims to lost territory in, in, a, in a nation. Uh, uh, or for, for a country, a claim that this uh, place is part of, of a nation. Um, Nordio was an outspoken irredentist who had built multiple major uh, buildings for the fascist state, uh, more than one explicitly celebrating irredentist organizations and, and martyrs. 
Uh, these include uh, Trieste's Casa dell'Opera Nazionale Belila, the uh, Belila headquarters built for the eponymous fascist uh, paramilitary uh, youth organization. Belila are, since they were East Europeanists, um, they're like the Pionieri, but with batons that they would use. Um, and the, uh, another building is the House of the Combatant, which you uh, see here on, on the right. Uh, and the, well, it's the House of the Combatant and the Mausoleum for Guillermo Robodan, uh, a uh, 19th century irredentist martyr uh, for and hero of the Italian unification movement. Uh, Nordio was also runner up in prizes, uh, or he had, he won runner up prizes uh, in most of the really important fascist paramilitary, I'm sorry, fascist uh, sponsored competitions. Uh, including those for the fascist headquarters in Rome in 1934 and for the Palace of the Exhibition of Italian Civilization in Rome in 1937. Um, these are like some of the most important uh, competitions, architectural competitions of the 20th century. Um, the Tower in Fiume, uh, which we see here, uh, completed in 1942, deploys familiar idioms of Italian rationalism with a gridded facade that is an unambiguous appropriation of the prime icon of Italian rationalism, Giuseppe Terragni's Casa del Fascio in Como, uh, which was completed in 1936, uh, three years before Nordio designed the Fiume Tower. Uh, Nordio had another project in Zara uh, that also referenced, uh, Zara, as we'll be talking about Zara later on, uh, that also referenced Terragni's Como building. And this, this was a connection that contemporaries uh, pointed out. Um, so, back to this tower, the facade of the Fiume Tower um, overlooks most of the old town while directly facing the border. Uh, the building's visible from lots of vantage points on both sides of the city and from the waters of the Adriatic, which began only blocks from the tower, although uh, it's not visible from the low-lying border crossing that we saw earlier. Um, they, the border crossing is, uh, is a, a tough point to see just about anything from. Um, Skip ahead to the close of the Second World War, and we're seeing this, this map uh, marking the, the shift in territory uh, again. And we find Nordio's Italian tower in the middle of a Yugoslav city. Uh, the contested city of Fiume, now called Rijeka, um, boasted a socialist Yugoslav government. The vast majority of its Italian-speaking residents were in flight, uh, imprisoned, or keeping their heads down. Um, under the leadership of uh, Joseph Broz Tito, uh, a successful partisan uh, resistance movement, and I'm, I'm simplifying here, uh, consolidated control over post-war Yugoslav lands and expanded into previously contested borderlands with Italy. Architecture, art, and urban planning were central tools of rebuilding a physically decimated infrastructure and also of constructing a new communist society. Significant, significant attention was given to the Italian borderland, particularly, uh, I'm sorry, partly because the region was so devastated, partly because socialist Yugoslavia had learned from her predecessor's failures uh, and aggressively sought to legitimize control over these newly acquired lands. Um, what then would this socialist Yugoslav government do with the tower? A beacon of Italianicity. Uh, a quintessentially Italian rationalist building still looming over downtown Rijeka. Demolish it, uh, reuse existing structures, strip and reclad the facade. Remarkably, Yugoslavia did none of this. To the contrary, the new state embraced the building's rationalist design and even touted its presence, albeit with a minimal, uh, but well, with some minimal, but well-considered additions. Uh, one domestic tourism book, published in the late 1940s and closely aligned with state interests and polemics, uh, used a full page photo of the formerly Italian skyscraper as the title page for the section on Rijeka Sushak and its surroundings, which is what you read here. Um, the photo is taken from a pedestrian eye level and shows the building towering above everything else, dwarfing a streetcar that occupies the foreground. Uh, the tower takes up half the frame uh, and the photo seems to be perspective corrected to improve the presentation of the building facade um, using a camera and a technique specific to architectural photography. That is, the photo is not an incidental snapshot, but an image created specifically to highlight this building and to represent it in its best light. Uh, the words Susha Krieka uh, are superimposed over the top half of the building. 
of the tower stands uh, in the image as it was originally designed and built, uh, aside from a single revision. At the top floor of the building, each of the four bays uh, has had a single letter added to it. And you'll see I include a slightly older postcard or a slightly newer postcard uh, to show it more clearly. Uh, T-I-T-O, the name of the head of the partisan army that drove out the fascist occupiers, and now the prime minister uh, of the young communist Yugoslavia. Uh, above these letters is a five-pointed communist star. Um, in other words, Yugoslavia appropriated a piece of fascist architecture into its own urban reimagination, and not just any piece, a building designed by an architect close to Mussolini in a style widely associated with fascism that was built in imitative competition with a Yugoslav national project right across the border. Uh, Tito's name in the communist star might be read as a graffitied taunt. Uh, we can write on this building, uh, we can deface it, or we might understand the revision as subversion or appropriation or spoliation. But one thing is clear, the communist Yugoslav government deliberately and carefully utilized art and architecture in its post-war engagements with territories acquired from Italy, and in so doing, aimed to make the sundry artifacts of territorial reclamation their own. Uh, moving on to my second example, uh, the reappropriation of uh, fascist Italian urban spaces with a focus on the city, uh, the new town of Russia. Uh, Already in 1945, the transitional uh, and post-war Yugoslav government began the hard work of rebuilding towns, roads, and national infrastructure. Uh, they reopened factories and mines and farms, uh, rapidly seeking to regenerate the flailing economy. Uh, by analyzing the ways the post-war Yugoslavia engaged with the legacies of two important towns, Arsi Arasha and Zara Zadar, uh, we see the complexities at stake in formulating a socialist urban imprint in spaces defined by Italian, uh, by the Italian legacy. Uh, so, first, Russia. Uh, in 1936, Mussolini inaugurated the coal mining town of Arsia, uh, which will become Russia, uh, built ex nihilo by the Italian fascist regime in nationally contested southeast Istria. The city's plans and buildings were designed primarily by the Italian architect Gustavo Pulitzer Fanelli uh, in an historically inflected modernist idiom that referenced a generic stripped down Italian vernacular tradition. And you can see some of that from even the, the aerial view that we have here. Uh, the scheme divided the central town into three main components. Uh, first, the workers' residences, which you see in the uh, further back of the image. Uh, in the form of single family houses. Uh, they're built along two parallel streets. And these are joined with the town center, which you see here. Uh, on the far side of this were apartments and villages behind outside of the, the frame for managers and company officials. So, um, well, these details are important for understanding how this town would become a lived space within a socialist polity. Uh, outside of this central tripart tripartite assembly is a playing field uh, here and a short distance away are industrial facilities for mining and processing coal, which was the uh, industrial purpose for creating the town. Uh, receiving the greatest attention in the design was the town center, which was oriented around a main square that features individually designed uh, components, including a church, uh, an afterwork community center, a dopo lavoro, uh, and oh, well, a cafe, a bakery, uh, and the Casa del Fascio. Um, the uh, party party headquarters. Uh, the town square's boundary is announced by a modernized Roman gate, uh, and uh, the standardized houses uh, of the for the workers uh, imitated vernacular Italian forms with stucco-clad arches and hipped tile roofs. In contrast, the residences for the factory's management were distinctly, albeit generically, uh, modern in their presentation with the flat or single pitch roofs uh, and compositional details, details that, art, that echo the art deco tendencies of the architect's earlier work, designing, uh, designing the festive interiors of uh, elite passenger ships. He was a cruise ship interior designer before he did this. Um, Ever-present stripped-down arches allude to a modern Roman empire. You see these here. Uh, 
Um, and in fact, uh, these are uh, a near identical detail uh, would uh, famously show up uh, a few years later in E42, the fascist showpiece uh, urban district on the outskirts of Rome. Um, the Arcia project was widely polemicized in fascist Italy as an exemplar of architecture's ability to uh, to help increase domestic productivity through the happy and wholesome participation of the population. Um, as one newspaper article from 1938 explained, uh, before Arcia, the region had only 1,300 workers and, quote, the logistical and social, social organization was primitive. But with the construction of the town, the number of workers was increased fivefold, uh, and the government introduced programs to improve their productivity and their quality of life. The article continues, quote, uh, Italy has created with Arcia the most beautiful and unsoiled mining territory that exists in Europe, a town of sun full of movement and color. Um, enumerating the multiple features of nearly every new town, the article explains that, quote, the hotels, the afterwork community center, the Casa del Fascio, the canteens, the cinema, the bar are always crowded. Uh, and in these places, quote, the workers, even those who work in the mine shafts, always present themselves in clean and proper attire. Uh, in this depiction, the town and the bureaucracy that created it does not allow the filthy work of mining to sully the collective life of its residents. To the contrary, readers are left with the image of a paradoxically pristine and properly modern mining town, one that is wildly productive, even as it uplifts its residents. Um, the design of the city distinctly embodies the fascist principles of collective identity, socio-political hierarchy, uh, and the ritual fidelity to the state uh, through productive labor that is a uh, hallmark of, of fascist uh, social structures. Um, the church takes the form of an overturned miner's wagon. This was much touted. Every, every article that, that dealt with it made this point if it's it's not entirely clear. I think to the miners it was uh, because uh, they encountered this every day, but when they were uh, communicating this to the rest of the Italians uh, who might not be miners in the region, uh, the, the writing on it always made that clear. Uh, one fascist era observer evoked the city's merging of religion with obligations to the state, uh, describing the church thus, quote, not angels, nor archangels, nor pious Madonnas or blessed Christ are seen carved outside and inside the church. But at the door, on one of the two pylons that flank it, stands the local karstic stone. Stands in the local karstic stone the distinct image of Barbara, the saint who protects the miners. Uh, this description and the author's willingness to articulate it indicate a bold erasure of traditional religious piety the literal removal of Christ and Madonna, uh, replaced by a fidelity to the particular needs of the party, uh, which deploys religious figures only insofar as they fit the party's propagandistic needs. Uh, this emphasis on the city's built-in hygiene, labor, state-oriented religion, and Italianness proves a late motif in fascist era representations of the city, uh, consistently showing up in Noticeable, noticeably similar terms. Uh, they have talking points, essentially. For example, uh, in a short newsreel on the town released in 1937, uh, it opens with the same playfully paradoxical characterization of Arcia as, quote, the white city of coal, a, quote, new town. Uh, this is what these, these uh, buildings, uh, towns from scratch were called, uh, that was built in, quote, the leading center of Italian coal. With no representation of the actual labor or machinery of mining, uh, a sanitized depiction of coal mining finds presence throughout the reel in the motif of the figure of a miner, you can see here. Uh, sculpted in white stone, clean, heroic, muscular, and holding a pickaxe. 40 seconds into the reel, the statue is unveiled and is immediately associated with the fascist party. Uh, when the sequence cuts directly from the just uncovered statue to a mass of people in the town square raising their hands repeatedly in unison in the fascist salute. Um, as in the above journalistic description that we looked at a minute ago, um, the church is then joined with the recurring character of the sculpted miner through 
I'm sorry, the church is joined with the sculpted minor through a carefully framed composition that pairs a view of the sculpture in the foreground with a view of the church showing only its campanile, uh, two Roman crosses and the upper portion of the building. This offers a triad among labor, church and state that is repeatedly reinforced throughout the reel by various additional juxtapositions. For example, the sculpture of St. Barbara, protector of minors is also paired with church and labor in a shot that distinctly parallels the previous view. She, like the minor, stands in the foreground, backed by a Roman cross and the church's campanile, including its clock face and its ringing bells. The film's concluding sequence is a series of views of the city's various amenities, uh, with a stationary camera resting momentarily on each of these amenities. Uh, following an elevated view of one of the two residential streets, we're shown a view of each public building uh, in the piazza with the sign for that institution prominently visible. Hotel, bar, company store, Arcio, Dopo Lavoro. Uh, the final object in the concluding montage is the town square's main gate, whose lintel features its own more verbose sign that is uh, at first only minimally legible. Uh, after the first view of this gate, which you see on the left, uh, the final shot of the film departs from the sequence of still frame shots to offer a close pan from left to right across that sign, uh, which reads, and those are, you see two stills from that uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, which reads, reigning Vittorio Emanuele Terzo III, um, Duce Benito Mussolini. Um, this closing view highlights the deployment of the signage of de the deployment in the signage of a familiar Roman convention in which an emperor would include his name on public works that he had sponsored. Thus, after establishing the polemical associations among mining, religion, and state, the real closes by presenting the town's public amenities and asserting without ambiguity that they were a gift of the king and the duce in the Roman imperial mold. Uh, Surprisingly, when this ideologically loaded, profoundly productive town shifted into Yugoslavia in the post-war period, almost nothing beyond the signage and explicit signifiers were changed. Little was added, little taken away. Arcia became Rasha. The Italian flag was replaced by the Yugoslav one. Uh, the major shift was its removal from the public discourse. It would be primarily known to Yugoslavs in the 1960s and 70s abstractly as a site of coal production, uh, a name at the top of a domestic productivity chart. Uh, Russia rarely shows up in an historical evaluation until after the breakup of Yugoslavia. At that point, a few historians begin to take stock of it. And as they do, it becomes clear that the city had become conceptualized during the socialist period uh, as a genuinely local place, a socialist era mining town. Uh, one article published in 2000, just as historians for post Yugoslav, uh, for the post Yugoslav Croatian state were taking stock of their new state's heritage, framed the city as, uh, quote, a town monument to the uh, modernist tradition, the regional landscape, and to the local population in their role as workers. Uh, it offers only superficial treatment of its fascist Italian context. The author's framing evokes socialist Yugoslavia's celebration of labor, um, the European cultural tradition, and Istrian solidarity, uh, all frameworks that serve to confirm Croatian claims to the city and territory without problematizing it through its associations, not only with the fascist regime, but with one that claimed that very land on which the town was built. In short, the article essentialized Russia as being European, Istrian, and a statement on labor, but not as Italian or fascist. Um, back to our map, our reference point. Um, turning to my final case, the city of Zadar, uh, which proved much more complicated than simply ignoring, than re-narrativizing. Uh, I wanna call out here that, uh, I'm gonna flip here, we see. Uh, this map, and you might have lost it, but this uh, in the circle is, is Zadar, which uh, during the interwar period, too complicated story to tell here, was a properly Italian place. It wasn't a colonial holding. It was Italy, part of Italy, 
uh, that was connected through the Adriatic, uh, through Adriatic shipping networks to, to the mainland. Uh, and then it was, it shifted back in the interwar period. Um, there we go. Zadar was a major city uh, and uh, the opposite of a new town. It wasn't built from scratch. It had a uh, long heritage. The surrounding area has prehistoric roots in a continuous and contentious use and a contentious and historiography uh, running from the Roman Empire to the present. Um, it's been held by the Romans, the Byzantine Empire, the Franks, the Venetians, the Habsburgs, a variety of locals, however we define that. Um, and between the world wars, it was part of Italy proper, as I, as I pointed out. The population, the infrastructure, the image of the city, both as built and as imagined, were all thoroughly Italianized by the end of World War II. Um, completely excluded from the mainland of Italy, the city was developed as an exclusively maritime entity. It was an exclave. Um, then, during the war, uh, the city was bombed heavily by the Allies with extensive uh, but only partial destruction. Uh, here, the red denotes destroyed structures. Um, with potential exaggeration, this seems to have been a polemical document that you're looking at on the, on the left or something that uh, was, was aiming to, to get support from international, the international community. Um, in the aftermath of the war, uh, we find three distinct plans for rebuilding the city. Uh, in 1947, 1951, and 1955, each revealing the slowly evolving process of architectural planning and reconstruction for this formerly uh, Italian urban enclave, uh, and the kinds of negotiations that occurred between the state, the profession, and implicitly the population over how to engage with the city's Italian irredentist history and memory. Uh, the initial post-war plan uh, by a team led by uh, the architect Zdenko Strijic, uh, minimized the Italian past it, and positioned Italian rule as an intermittent occupation. Uh, the project didn't simply seek to dispense with every component uh, of uh, that was introduced by fascist Italy. It, it also laid Yugoslav claims on elements that were previously exploited by Italian irred irredentists. For example, uh, it challenged the Italians equating of a Mediterranean character with Italianness uh, by, in this plan, uh, in this scheme, championing the Mediterranean aspects of the city as part of the Yugoslav past. Uh, it called for opening the city to the sea and maintaining the ancient Roman grid that was governed by the Cardo and the Decumanus. Uh, these are famously the two primary axes of every planned Roman city. Uh, this aggressive engagement of the Mediterranean and the ancient Roman put the architects in a precarious planning position since it relied on the same discursive framing the Italian fascists had utilized. Nevertheless, this ethic of selective appropriation persisted through the various urban plans that would follow uh, and profoundly shaped the slowly rebuilt city. Uh, even more than the proposed urban plan itself, the polemics surrounding the first plan speak to the Yugoslav architectural profession's broader concern with devaluing or reappropriating perceptions of the city's built Italian heritage. Uh, in 1947, uh, the cover of the inaugural issue of Yugoslavia's leading architecture journal, Architectura, uh, shows a plan of the city of Zadar. Uh, and the corresponding article was written by Strzic himself. Uh, the article carefully frames the city's Italian elements in a longer uh, historical context, defining, devaluing, and ultimately delegitimizing these Italian arguments. Um, Strzic, became, Strzic began by characterizing Italian architectural production as belonging to, quote, the period from the 19th century until today, uh, which immediately cuts out the Roman tradition from the Italian one. Uh, and it rejects Italy's narrative of the city's Romanità, uh, the concept uh, of a place's Romanness that the fascists used to justify uh, just about all of their irredentism. Uh, Strzic then deftly reformulated the city's fascist era Italian architecture as not essentially Italian, but rather as a product of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, along the way, he roped the contested city of Rijeka Fiume, which we were talking about earlier, into this 
uh, architectural historical narrative, explaining that in the 19th century, quote, Austria chose to endow with classicism the cities of Zara and Rijeka by bringing back to life, quote, in stiff courtly forms, the dead canons of the Renaissance. Uh, so here he acknowledges Italian styled architecture. He's saying, yes, there is stuff that looks Italian, uh, but he undermines fascist Italy's claims uh, that, the presence, that the presence of Italian imbued architecture testified to Italian rights to a place. He's saying the Italian architecture was Habsburg and they were faking it and doing it badly anyway. Um, but he didn't stop with this dismissal of Italian architecture as Austrian design. He also ravaged the architecture itself. Um, the design of the buildings in both Zara and Rijeka, the article grumbles, quote, simply drowned the cities, leading to, quote, a period of discord during which an array of urban maladies arose. Among these, citizens were unable to have, quote, a good relationship with life uh, or with the sea. Uh, in a critique that's especially cutting to modernist sensibilities, he explains that the Austrian, Austrians created city facades uh, behind which the real cities vegetate. And this is uh, to tell a modernist that he's just creating facades is, is, is the, the, the most terrible critique you can offer. Um, this elaborate attack on the Austrian made classicism is hitched to the Italians with a single dismissive sentence, quote, the Italian period presented just more of the same. Such uh, incompetent planning, he contends, resulted from an, uh, quote, unbiased, meaningless whole with disorganized circulation, uh, in which the architecture, quote, has no relation whatsoever with natural elements, nor with the historical architecture that impressed a mark of harmony and timelessness on the old town. Uh, thus, in a single rehistoricization of the city, city Sturzic not only nabs the city's ancient Roman heritage from the Italian iridentist's quiver, uh, but he even presents Zadar's modern era Italian architecture as both a failure and an Austrian legacy. Um, now, the accuracy of this narrative is debatable, but then the question, what is the true architectural heritage of the city, misses the whole point here, at least as I'm approaching it. Uh, in this post-war moment, Zadar was a city physically devastated by bombing with a population that was similarly uh, part erased by the war and a post-war Italian exodus. To these planners, the memory of the city's earlier form, along with the half-destroyed city itself, were clay to be molded. Uh, as Sturzic and others began to write about the city, they actively chose what artifacts of the city's history would be preserved uh, remembered and incorporated into spatial conceptions of the city and its heritage. That is, they're both writing the history and rebuilding the city, the, the artifacts, almost the archival, in a way, the archival artifacts it's themselves. Uh, and, and they get to work on, on both fronts. Um, despite its effective rhetoric, the initial scheme by Sturzic's team uh, was not formally adopted, the result of both funding difficulties and because, as one historian described, it was, uh, quote, a very radical utopian plan. Um, with no federal funding earmarked for its construction, Zadar became something of a secondhand quarry uh, from which regional builders spoliated materials uh, from damaged buildings for products that were, were outside the city. Um, Yugoslavia's first instinct was exploitation of the former Italian stronghold. This was the case until uh, in 1948, Miroslav Krlija, the novelist and vice president of the Yugoslav Academy of Sciences and Arts, uh, Yazoo, uh, staged public criticisms for the failure to conserve the city's monuments. Uh, Kurdoja found value, cultural and propagandistic, uh, in the city's complicated Italian past. Uh, he spearheaded the staging of a major competition in 1953 for a new master plan of the old city of Zadar. Um, 14 elaborate schemes were submitted to this competition. Well, oops. Okay, you see, yes, good. You see, uh, you should be seeing four, uh, four schemes. Um, four of, uh, four boards from the 14 schemes and probably a hundred panels. Um, so most of these schemes uh, worked to balance principles of modern planning with the old city's fabric and its Mediterranean character by 
by building in local materials, by highlighting the historical components, such as its towers, uh, maintaining or appropriating the city's originally Roman grid, and stressing the traditional terracotta roofs, among other gestures. Um, Italian claims to the city loomed large, and while they produced an anxious tension in post-war designs, Yugoslav schemes didn't abandon, erase, or suppress the extended history of the place. To the contrary, they embraced it. Uh, the competition boards often went to great lengths to graphically emphasize the joining of the dehistoricized post-war architecture and the city's traditional fabric, uh, as in this proposal that we're looking at, that collages austere line drawings uh, of rectilinear modernist buildings with intricate drawings or photographs, uh, here being the photograph, uh, of existing historical elements. Um, Similarly, multiple proposals included perspectival renderings that placed detailed reproductions of historic buildings at the center of the frame, representing proposed modernist interventions as only adjacent to and supporting the central role of these historical buildings. And as you saw from the amount of destruction, uh, it's not like the city was mostly historic buildings, uh, but these projects tend to uh, elevate the historic buildings that, that remained and propose restorations for them. Um, There we go. Uh, a number of the projects also included elevations stretching dozens of linear feet uh, in a way that visually emphasized the prominence of historic buildings, especially the city's medieval towers poking up above the roof line. Uh, and uh, as you see, uh, especially this shows up in lots of them. Uh, they, it seemed that each of them thought it would be a cool trick to uh, have the towers pop up above their, their long sheets. Um, onto the, the backing board, uh, and they, uh, it turns out they were all using the same, the same trick. Um, so they're emphasizing these, these medieval towers. Um, so these also favored, these and others favored a viewpoint from the sea, uh, placing particular importance on the city's maritime character, um, which had been the a major tool of Italian air dentists, uh, as do renderings that prominently feature fishermen, small boats, and other small scale, small scale maritime accoutrement. Uh, this proposal particularly emphasizes the city's Mediterranean and its Roman traditions with a huge perspectival rendering of fishermen in striped shirts at their boats in the foreground with the city's well-known uh, Roman gate uh, framed by two occupied sail, framed by the two occupied sailboats. Uh, and it's the only detailed object in, in the background. Everything else is kind of generic. And then there's this one object that is that gets uh, formal prominence. Um, the jury, composed of prominent Croatian cultural figures, selected three projects as finalists, uh, but declined to formally adopt any of them, citing surprisingly that among other problems, None of the projects had adequately addressed the problems of incorporating the historical. Uh, this seems strange since they were so focused on the historical, but the committee thought that none of them went far enough. Um, but one uh, architect planner on one of the finalist teams, Bruno Milic, um, was asked to develop yet another plan, which he completed in 1955. Uh, the scheme called for maintaining some of the old city walls. Uh, the closure of the city core to automobile traffic and the maintenance of the historical scale and blocks of the old city. Uh, despite this embrace of historical components, the plan allowed for new, legibly modern construction, and it incorporated socialist planning principles by uh, appropriating existing courtyard spaces for public use and increased urban flows. Uh, although this plan was never officially adopted by the city, uh, it became a de facto guide governing the subsequent redevelopment of the city. Post-war planning of Zadar was defined by Yugoslavia's and Zadar's convoluted relationships with their own histories, uh, both the fascist Italian history and also the Roman and Venetian histories on which, the fasci on which fascist Italy had staked its claims to land. These intricate histories were overlaid with the ambiguous and flexible meanings of many of the cities architectural and urban signifiers. For example, uh, to what extent the ancient Roman denoted modern Italian. Such considerations were in turn overlaid with the pragmatic needs of local and regional development, 
for example, as an intentionally uh, isolated interwar cities that are needed to be converted into a regionally infrastructurally integrated post-war city. Uh, and woven into all of these dilemmas was the specter of Italy, its past presence and its persistent aspirations. There was a continuing polemic that this is Italian territory. But the threat of Zadar's Italian past was rarely articulated openly in planning discourse. Uh, instead, this threat tended to be referenced and negotiated only in a rarefied, ambiguous code. For example, in drawings of local fishermen with the city's familiar Roman gate behind them. Evaluating the challenge of the planning of Zadar, art historian Jarko Domrian, writing in 1969, even as the rebuilding was being completed and thus both operating within and reflecting upon a period of Yugoslav uh, rebuilding and territorial claims taking. Um, that is, he was both an historian and a uh, political actor at the moment. Um, explained, he explained that the city had posed an especially difficult challenge to socialist Yugoslav architectural thinking because of the, quote, dilemma uh, between reconstructing the pre-war city and, quote, opening up the historic urban core with contemporary architecture. Um, the verb he chose to describe how planners might, quote, open up Zadar's historic core historic core is uh, oslobadanje, uh, which in urban planning terms indicates a freeing up, a making space less congested and clogged. It's a, a fairly common term that you see. And yet one cannot help but notice the similarity here to post-war Yugoslav discourse, popular political Yugoslav discourse, um, in that uh, oslobadanje, or liberation, uh, was an ever-present term and a concept that defined every historical narrative on Yugoslav uh, defeat of fascism and the resulting liberation of the people. Um, the author's verb choice can't be definitively read as an intentional allusion to the ideologically charged sister term. Um, but like the scores of ambivalent signifiers that littered the half destroyed post-war Zadar, as well as the architectural documents that aspired to remake it, Domlian's word choice reveals through innuendo the complex mission that planners and historians of Zadar had undertaken to quote, liberate the city from its fascist past, even while embracing its history uh, and to exercise the ghost of Italy from post-war Zadar. Um, so in conclusion, um, a socialist, as socialist Yugoslavia forged a new society and a new history, um, Architects, planners, and artists drew upon and reappropriated and subverted the Italian legacy in sophisticated and conscientious ways. Rather than simply erasing remnants of fascism or of Italy, the Yugoslav socialist regime, as well as local independent actors, drew upon and re-narrativized local material culture uh, in order to reframe it as inherently socialist and inherently Slavic. And they were successful. Uh, they built war memorials that featured collective suffering at the hands of the Italian fascists. They redefined Italy's urban spaces as historically Mediterranean and contemporarily socialist. And they created an ambitious new mapping program to create both uh, cartographic and mental maps of contested coastlands as part of a contiguous Yugoslavia. Uh, these acts served the dual purposes of uh, convincing the international community that socialist Yugoslavia deserved this land, and also convincing local inhabitants that they belonged, at least for now, to Yugoslavia. Um, thank you. I look forward to your feedback. Uh, I'm eager to improve this piece and the larger project. Um, thank you very much, Matt. And round of applause, and probably the audience is doing the same as well. Um, Great, we've got questions already popping in. If you have questions, um, please use the Q&A box if possible. Um, that'll be the easiest way for me to, uh, to navigate this and moderate these um, without be causing too much confusion. Um, but we do have a question. So Matthew, do you think the lack of coordination between politicians, administration, and infrastructure planners that you referenced at the beginning of your talk is the result of an overemphasis of the political in the post-war? Do you think it's because of the white noise created of how to plan on top of, around, and within different state cultures? Or do you think these transition spaces just didn't matter as much to centralizing states to be anything more than publicized symbols of incorporation instead of making them planned 
economically functioning spaces? Um, well, it, it was a big question. <laughs> it, um, I feel like it's a, a, a I should have a, two hours to write out an, an answer and, and uh, submit it to my, my professor. Um, I, I think I think I can answer. I want to answer that in in big terms. Uh, I my notes didn't get all of the details. Uh, emphasis on planning or on the the role of uh, uh, symbols at being kind of under, being understood in in symbolic terms. Um, I think I think it's a result uh, of of the so it was. I think the question describes it as a, a failure to, to understand that. Uh, I would say that the result, we, we would, our tendency is to understand this as, as a failure um, because it, part of that is, is the fact that we imagine a, uh, a government, imagine a state, especially a, uh, a powerful state uh, and what we came to understand uh, as a later Yugoslavia and the associations between later Yugoslavia and say other regimes in Eastern Europe uh, as, as in totalitarian terms. And we imagine that the totalitarian has their hands in everything. And I think it's just that these are, are complex situations that are coming out of a post-war context and nobody knows what the hell to do. Um, and this is in throughout this larger study, I, I recognize, uh, I. I I kept recognizing, digging through the archives and then making sense of the material in the archives that time and again, people don't know what the hell to do. And that makes it, that's part of what makes it so interesting because local populations, well, it, who, it creates something of a power vacuum. Uh, this sort of, this disorder creates a power vacuum and people are able to step in at all these different levels and you've got Local planners saying, "I can grab a little piece of this power, a little piece of this control." Yugoslavia wants to, the, you know, Belgrade wants to fund this, but I'm the only one who knows what's going on at a local level, uh, and uh, and so I'm going to step in and, and claim these things. Um, so, I don't know if it's a if it's an example of a failure to plan uh, by the state uh, any more than any state actor in a post-conflict situation is failing to plan. Uh, no, things have to be delegated. Uh, and that delegation takes an extreme form when you don't have enough bread for the local population. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Can you tell more about reappropriations of religious buildings and spaces in post-war Yugoslavia? Uh, re religious buildings and what spaces? Um, just religion buildings slash spaces, so either or. Okay, oh, I see, I have, do I have these? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see everything. Oh, oh <laughs> that makes things easier. Um, uh, sorry, where is um, the first one? So, um, G ah, go ahead. Up. Um, under the open tab. Under the open tab. So there should be three tabs: open, answered, and dismissed. No, I don't see any of those. Okay, it's okay. Sorry. Um, oh, Q and A. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, open. Uh, tell more about the reappropriations of religious buildings and spaces in the post-war Yugoslavia. Yeah. Um, well, religious, I'd say uh, something of, it's what you see in the appropriation of religious buildings tends to be a, a version of a sort of Kamalist light version. Uh, where if we think of the model of the Hagia Sophia that is, that's turned into uh, a, a museum, uh, there's, there's a museification, there seems to be a museification of, of religious buildings in, in uh, Yugoslavia. And I presume that uh, this is the question of religion in, in Yugoslavia is, is what's getting at this or what uh, uh, Gaspar is, is getting at. Um, of course, we know that uh, the nations of Yugoslavia, the, the multinational Yugoslavia are defined uh, in, uh, somewhat defined in terms of their, their religious affiliation or re religious status. Uh, and so you don't get this complete dismissal of say a Catholic, uh, Catholic space, a mosque um, or, uh, or Orthodox church. Um, 
but in many of them, especially the older uh, artifact, the archeological uh, or the churches that can be treated as uh, archeological spaces uh, or historic spaces become museified. And there's still practice that's, that is, they, they're still maintained for practice, uh, but they aren't, um, they aren't championed. Uh, any, anytime they show up in publications, in, uh, in polemics, they are part of the long cultural lineage of the Slavic, of Slavic space. Um, I am thinking of a, a different example, uh, Zlatko Ugrian's White Mosque uh, that is uh, treated, uh, it's, it's a mosque, it's a, a modern uh, uh, building, uh, and it's also treated as, it's considered to be one of the, the memorials or monuments the, of Spomenici. Uh, of, of Yugoslavia, uh, which is, uh, well, in a way that's doing the same thing, turning it into a, it's a pilgrimage space, but it becomes almost a socialist pilgrimage space uh, as, as an Islamic one. Thank you. Um, so the next question, it got cut off a little, but I think maybe you could probably say a couple of words to it. Um, that many partisan monuments in the Croatian regions controlled by Italy during World War II still stand whereas the vast majority of partisan monuments elsewhere in Croatia um, were removed um, after the independent state of Croatia came into, it, came into it existence in 1991. Um, I'm guessing they're kind of, you know, why one side has them still, why one side doesn't um, to some extent, if you have. Interesting, yeah. Um, so they were destroyed, you're saying that the, the ones in, that's true, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's not a it's not a, a uniform uh, practice, but uh, the ones the ones that dealt in the, both in these territories and the ones the the, the monuments that dealt with uh, or that define themselves against the fascist Italian threat specifically remained. I mean, this might be a claim staking. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, it might be a claim staking uh, of Croatian territory against Italian space uh, and a, a an understanding of the need to. Continue that polemic uh, in other polemics might have been might have, have uh, become less useful, uh, not so much for state actors, but for for well, uh, a combination. It's there's really I think in the destruction of a lot of these monuments, there's there's a an unspoken exchange between uh, violence, people committing violence against memorials or keep committing I guess destructive uh, destructive graffiti uh, and and the state that's allowing it to to happen and the local communities that are approving or disapproving disapproving of it um, and I, I you might say that or I might postulate that uh, that there's an understanding that the ones uh, defining Istria defining contested territories as not Italian are considered still, uh, culturally relevant, culturally important. That's a great, great point, uh, Francesco. Thank you. Excellent. Um, another question. So, especially looking at Arsia Rasha, um, do you think the emphasis that both Italian fascism and socialist Yugoslavia shared in their own ways on modernization as authoritarian modernization from above helped to reappropriate, resignify these buildings and spaces? Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Okay, yeah, 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 there's, it's layered. It's that both Italian fascism and socialist Yugoslavia shared on modernization as authoritarian modernization from above helped to reappropriate signify. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I, that's, part of, that's part of what I find fascinating. I, I don't, I wouldn't say, so I, I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, postulate, to, to hypothesize universal characteristics of power totalitarianism in this. Um, but I think I would, I would frame it not from above that there's some, uh, some superstructure that is, that, is, that is inherent to these two uh, practices, political practices. But instead from below, uh, I would tend to, I tend to extrapolate um, or I tend to see um, Practices of discovery of parallels 
like what's there are certain things that are there and there are certain things that we can use uh, the things that align will use and the things that don't align will push will will get rid of them uh, and yes there is a, a a tide there's a there's both fascism and and communism are um, argue for the success of a state not by being uh, not by being luddites but by being having tractors and uh, both and so each of those states it, each of these, each of these models, as enacted by Italy and Yugoslavia, uh, had those in common, and I think Yugoslavia said, "Oh, wow, that's there. Let's use it." Or not even Yugoslavia, but the local actors were saying, "Well, we got to use this somehow. What are we going to do? What are we going to do?" And they say, "Oh, wow. Well, you know, they liked workers, and we like workers. Great." <laughs> and they talk about workers in different ways, um, completely different ways. Uh, but but they and so they there's this. Uh, in a way, you could say that the uh, polemics aren't the same. It's not that they share a polemic, but they shift the polemic. It's from workers as the the peons to workers as the champions, uh, or as the as the heroes. Excellent. Um, another question. So, insofar as these urban forms are planned, in quotes. Um, to what extent can you contrast the different ideological um, inflections of their planning, hierarchy slash corporatism versus um, samupravlenia, or sorry, that was the Russian command, um, but is there um, a self-managed nature to Yugoslav reappropriation of Zadar, et cetera? Um, yes, um, and and that is, well, there's there's a, Self-management, well, as as this this questioner knows, uh, self-management is it. So, I would distinguish between uh, self-management imposed top-down, that is, uh, or even acknowledged top-down, uh, that is, uh, the Yugoslav, some part of the Yugoslav state saying you are now going to self-manage yourself, which is, I mean, there is a paradox to that. Uh, and I know that there is, it's, a, it's more complex than, than the wagging of a finger from Belgrade. Um, but I would distinguish between that on one hand, uh, where, where self-management self is an institutional practice and uh, something that I think you're getting at, Will, uh, which is the, um, Un, uh, unsanctioned self-management, uh, which I find uh, in these somewhat and in this this talk somewhat uh, much more in the rest of the manuscript. Uh, that again, uh, I'll go back to my answer to the first question. Nobody really knows what's going on in a lot of these situations, and it isn't managed from a meticulous way with with Tito saying you're going to do this, uh, but instead. Who's, you know, how is this road going to be paved in with, with asphalt or with cobblestones? Um, that's a decision that's made at a local level, uh, at a very local level. I mean, it might be made by a second assistant in an architecture office, um, but it has, or it might be seated by a second assistant in an architecture office, but it has uh, profound implications for the character of a space. And I'm especially interested in the kind of that unsanctioned self-management of just who the hell's going to do things and how is it going to work out. And I don't think that's something unique to Yugoslavia. I think it's something that is more characteristic of uh, the instability of border situations and the instability of post-conflict situations. Excellent. Um, let's see, another question. Um, this one you might want to also check out just because it is a little bit like here. <laughs> But um, I would love for you to talk more about the two towers, Italian and Yugoslav, that you juxtaposed near the start of the talk. How do they? Um, how do their similar but distinctive forms allow us to distinguish between fascist and socialist modernist aesthetics? Um, as someone unversed in Italian rationalism, I had difficulty identifying the features of fascist modernism um, beyond the neo-Roman arches of the miners' village. Also, do you think conclusions can be drawn from the distinctive ways that fascism and socialism remembered history? Or is your project more geared towards highlighting continuities between these ideologies? Oh, uh, wow. Okay, good. So there are a few, a few dilemmas entwined in this. Uh, for one, I want to um, put on my my distinctly 
uh, architectural historian hat and say that uh, there, there's a long debate or a long, I don't know, struggle uh, in architectural history over the role of um, Italian fascist, fascist era Italian architecture. Um, there were moments in the historiography and in the politics associated with the historiography that um, we, we, when I was 12, uh, but we as an institution wanted to say, um, there is a fascist architecture and I see it. And I, I referenced fascist uh, 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 rationalism. Uh, there were multiple movements and there was really a rich discourse of architecture in interwar Yugoslavia. And this is where, uh, this is where we've moved. We as architectural historians have moved out of this uh, paralleling of the architecture produced in fascist Italy with uh, fascism. Um, but nonetheless, there are overlaps and there are a, a lot of the architects, I mean, the prime patron, the best patron of architecture in, in Italy, in fascist Italy was the fascist state, the fascist party. Um, and another problem with this is that a lot of the interwar fascist architecture was good. I mean, if, you're, if you work within uh, the terms of the self-defined terms of modernism, it's, it's well-resolved stuff. Uh, and so we as architectural historians have had to deal with that. Um, I say that as prelude to answering your question, but an important prelude. Uh, what I showed of Tarani's Casa del Fascio um, was a, uh, a, a version of Italian rationalism that doesn't necessarily, it's not saying, it's not saying, it's not using arches to define uh, its Italian history, but it, instead it makes an argument that uh, the tradition of Italian architecture, and this is also an unjust summary, but the tradition, the long tradition of Italian architecture is a slow refinement toward a rational, uh, abstractly knowable, true architecture. And the rationalists were, were trying to approach that. And so they position themselves in the tradition of the Renaissance, et cetera. Um, this is all to say that Italian rationalism was recognizable to Italians. Uh, it was recognizable, especially to Italian architects. Um, but you, there's nothing. Uh, there are very. It's it's hard to argue that there's much about it that is inherently deeply truly fascist. Um, however, if we look at the two uh, towers, uh, yes, they are quite similar, and they were imitating one another. And I, I should. We don't need to share the image now. Um, but. Uh, I would say that they were distinguishable stylistically uh, by at least architectures and those culturally versed. This, these are the two towers on either side of the border. Uh, it, they, they were distinguished ar architecturally by those who were versed. And, uh, but I think they operated socioculturally uh, as also socioculturally at just the, bro the, the, the bare level of an object on this side of the border. And it looked modern. It looked developed and it was a beacon uh, in the same way that you, if you put a, a, a huge radio tower up uh, on that side of the border, you would be saying things about your state.